what employee engagement questions are we asking now in the midst of this, you know, kind of, you know, this sort of health, economic, and cultural crisis uh, that we weren't asking uh, before? And, and, and how does that, you know, shape the way we view internal communications? So in the old way, we sort of asked this question of how can we help our employees have more job satisfaction, right? Job satisfaction is good. We like people to, to like their job. We still obviously care about that. But I think right now, we much more have this question, which is how can we help our employees connect to our higher purpose? Um, so, you know, job satisfaction is one thing. There's a lot of things that are different about people's jobs now. The environment is different. Some of the other things that people contend with on a day-to-day -day basis are different. Um, but I think one of the primary things that, that actually we need to think about is, is how to connect to a higher purpose and how do we do that in an environment where sort of the natural ways that we have to connect maybe aren't there. You know, face-to-face -face repeated interactions. Um, meetings where we can kind of reinforce, you know, sort of company culture by, again, that kind of like direct interaction. And so there's much more of, I think, an emphasis now on connecting to higher purpose. Um, maybe this is true. I don't know if this is the case for anyone attending. Certainly this is true for us. We have people who are onboarded as new team members or new employees that have never directly met anyone else in person. Everything has been from Zoom. I don't know, is this the case for anyone now where really there is no shared direct experience or interaction at all. It's all done entirely from this. So one of the ways that sort of impacts us and I think that impacts like communications is new rule number one, which is reinforce higher level values in internal communications. So I think we sort of naturally have a sense that, okay, it's important to sort of align on our purpose. It's important to understand what is the mission of our company. It's important to stand the, the why behind the what of what we're doing. But I think what is different now is when you work out your calm strategy and you're working out whatever your channels may be that you connect with, with, with people, with teams, with departments, reinforcement of those higher level values, not just as something that, you know, values that sit on your website that are kind of nice there and good for marketing and maybe good for recruiting, but something that is actually reflected in what you're doing on an everyday basis. Those kind of messages you're sending are really important. Um, one example of this and, and why I think this has to be engaged all the way through the organization is, is right before the pandemic hit, I was actually at, at, at a conference and I was sitting around in a circle um, with about 20 you know, mostly CEOs of companies, uh, a few kind of like other founders who maybe weren't in the CEO role. And just as an experiment, I, I sort of asked this question, which I hadn't ever really got direct feedback on, which I, I said, like, I went to each person and I said, can you remember and recite your company's values, whatever they are? Like, one, do you, I asked, do you have them? And most people said, yes, they, they have them. And I said, what are they? And I actually asked each person and, and, and put them on the, put him or her on the spot. And usually what happened is I usually had like four or five values and usually they, they got like the first two. It's like one or two in there. And then it started getting like a little bit fuzzy. So I actually think right now, um, because we don't have a lot of those sort of direct connections in, in a sort of a physical way or the way we're connected has shifted, connecting higher level values in internal communications. And that doesn't mean just sort of saying that these are our values, but in everything we're doing, um, uh, what I try to encourage our teams, what I encourage for, for some of the client work we do on internal comms is if we're looking at whether that's like, you know, an email message that's going out or a newsletter, whether that's uh, a video that's, you know, being distributed or communicated, whether it's some other channel, you know, it's on social that we're doing or it's an intranet uh, or, or other platform. In every communication are we, that we're doing, what values are we reinforcing? We can start by just like itemizing them and saying, okay, these are our four or five values. You know, how is that being reinforced, reinforced in this communication? And then trying to actually think explicitly. And if we look at our entire body and our entire strategy, if we have like, yeah, we communicate, you know, value one and two all the time, but three, four, and five, we're hard pressed to do. How do we look for more opportunities to bring those to life? So I do think there was a trend overall in, in making sort of value-based or, or purpose-based communications, you know, more important as, as, as I think I'm, I'm interested to see anyone listening. If you've done more of that, what have you done? But I think in the pandemic, this has been heightened. And in particular, 
some of the groups of team members and employees that, that we sort of, we consider maybe um, the most challenging to, to get high performance in the sort of remote work environment is even more important. So usually when I talk to companies, they're, they feel pretty good in the remote work setting about, you know, senior, how, you know, management's doing, certainly senior leadership, anyone who's kind of sort of very self-directed. And where some of the concern is, is really on, you know, people who are like, like lower level, up and coming. Uh, I get a lot of questions about the millennials and other things like that too. Uh, and so one of the, the things I think is that, you know, for those kind of groups, whether it's millennials or it's Generation Y, you know, much more purpose-driven companies and connecting with a higher purpose is just, is, is part of the norm. So I think, especially for those kind of groups, those kind of groups of employees, reinforce new rule number one, reinforcing higher level values um, becomes really, really important. And that's gonna be critical for uh, people retention and, and many other things as we start to come out of this, you know, sort of recover, there's more people hiring. Um, there's less of a connection to the company because you haven't seen people directly in, in you know, maybe at, you know, nine months or a year. Um, that higher level value specifically with those kind of audiences are gonna be important for, for, for overall performance and people retention. So that's the new rule um, number one. Let's go on to the sort of next set of questions. So the old way before all of this, um, uh, and certainly at the beginning of all of this, like if you think back to February and March, we would ask sort of like, how do I ensure that our employees are staying on task, right? We kind of wanted to know that like, People are, are, are generally like, like being good employees. They're sticking with it. They're not being distracted. And we did a lot that was based on, you know, just like the eyeball check, right? Like, do people seem like they're kind of busy? Do people seem like they're engaged in these, these meetings? Uh, and suddenly, that's maybe more, more difficult, right? We don't have the eyeball check as much. Sometimes we're in, in Zoom uh, chats or Zoom meetings and um, people have their video off. You can't see what they're doing. You have no idea if they're there or not. Sometimes, you know, you ask them a question, they're on mute. They don't realize they're on mute or they're just not listening. You're not sure. So we kind of shifted from this old way of how do I ensure that our employees are staying on task to this new way of how do I ensure that our team is actively engaged? And what are the signs of, of active engagement? And I think one of the big shifts and, and one of the big issues in this shift to remote work is understanding the different phases of productivity and how those phases can be managed on an organizational level, particularly with big shifts in how people are, are, are working. So let me kind of give you sort of our breakdown. We work with our clients um, and we're developing, you know, particularly we have a number of clients now that are, that are asking for how can we, you know, be better in implementing remote work in our, in our organization. Um, and we have the four phases of remote work productivity. And, and let me kind of break down each of these. So the first phase um, is relocation. And so what relocation means is just like, we're just trying to place shift. You used to go to your desk. You used to go to meetings in your office and now you're not going there. So we're just trying to like get you to do everything that you could do in that setting, but like now do it in a different place. That's phase number one. Phase number two is synchronization. So let's say we've successfully working in another place. A lot of companies are doing that now. Now, can we be synchronized in a way that was just as good as how we were before. So I think a lot of what you see on that when, when, when companies implement this is you'll see, okay, we need more check-ins, right? More check-ins of teams or all hands of teams or departments or even whole companies coming together, right? We need more one-on-one -on -one time, right? So we just need to be synchronized uh, uh, better. So that kind of becomes phase two when you start really implementing remote work product. Phase three is systemization. So now that we've got everyone synced, what actually happens with systemization is we really improve asynchronous, as in the A before the synchronous, a synchronous work habit, saying we don't have to just always come together in a meeting at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday. We don't just have to have these one-on-one -on -one check ins although those are good, but how do we uh, actually align through systems uh, in ways that allow us to do this in an asynchronous manner, manner. That becomes important because there's a lot of gains as people work remotely 
um, that can be had for being able to do this. So for example, maybe I don't know, you know, in, in the audience, how many of you have kids, but maybe you have a certain time of day that you're like, you know, if your kids are, are back in school now, you're like picking them up from school. Um, and, and maybe you didn't, you didn't do that before. So if we can improve systemization, there's no reason that should be a detriment to your work. In fact, it could be an improvement, right? You could be better, you know, better, more engaged because you can take care of, 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 of the child that needed your attention at the moment is, then you can shift back and there's more flexibility. You don't have a long commute. So systemization um, has, has huge gains. And basically the flow is you go from being synchronous, meaning let's all be together at the same time to asynchronous um, and there's great gains there. And then finally, the fourth phase of remote work productivity is empowerment. So empowerment is we are actually much better, much higher functioning from remote work than actually if we were in, per in person together, let's say. So we're leveraging the medium for its strength. So what are some examples of when you, you know, reach empowerment, what are the things, some of the things you can do as an organization? Well, uh, for instance, you can have better brainstorms uh, and, and sort of idea and creative generation from people in all different offices that would not normally collaborate, right? Because you've embraced this sort of remote work productivity in a way that you can do it, you actually get, you know, you, you break down the silos and people can collaborate better because you're structured this way. Um, or uh, we might say, for instance, um, uh, you know, when, when you're empowered, um, maybe, you know, things that you couldn't do at the office, like maybe you couldn't, uh, you know, I don't know, if you take your 15 minute exercise break and you like doing your push-ups, you like getting a little sweat going or something like that, that was just, just weird, right? Or you can't play music in a way, blasting at your, at your desk when other people are gonna hear it and suddenly you can. So how do we use, you know, the remote work medium at, for, for, for its best, for its strength that actually makes us better and stronger? So that's the fourth phase. And so that brings us, and, I, and I'd love to hear comments for the group, for, for what phase you're in at. Like, are you just like, relocating things to remote work? Are you in this phase of like, we're just trying to get more synchronized? Are you trying to get more systematized? We don't have to all do it at the same time. Or are you truly empowered where you are functioning better than you could if you were working um, directly? And, and I, I love comments in the chat. And, and Jackson, if you have thoughts here too, from kind of what, what you heard from, from attendees and, and, and even our team. But what I would say as a frame up is that it brings us to new rule number two, which is take a phased approach to remote work management. And specifically, if we go back to this, the biggest issues that we've seen with our clients is skipping phases. It's saying like, okay, we're gonna go into this like highly systematized work where we're not gonna have any face-to-face -face meetings. We don't have to have more opportunities for, for, for syncing up and it fails. Or we're gonna go immediately to this empowerment or we're gonna go immediately to synchronization when we haven't even confirmed that people like still have their password access that used to be on their machine at work and that was available on the internet, but they can even get it home and get through the firewall. So a lot of the problems is that some of the solutions, if you do this in a phased approach, are the problems if you try to skip um, phases. And I don't know if you have thoughts, Jackson, or other thoughts from the room. Sure. Um, well, there are, there are kind of two, two uh, thoughts and two comments that I think are, are relevant here. Uh, the first is a question from, from Renee. Who, who asked about non-office workers. So those who don't work on the manufacturing, or those who work on like the manufacturing floor, for example, who don't have regular access to email, internet, et cetera. Um, and, and I'm sure that you have some thoughts on kind of how to engage these yeah. non-office workers. But one thing I'll say is that, that you know, there, there are a lot of technological solutions uh, now that can help with that. Um, we actually have a client, Beekeeper, who is, a, a app that is designed for employee engagement um, for non or for non desk workers specifically yeah. for that specifically right for that specifically in a platform that can do that right and that's particularly important if you're not having you know daily stand ups in the same way you might on the manufacturing floor because you're trying to encourage people to maintain distance if if some of the traditional uh, means of, of communicating are disrupted the other question that I'll I'll throw out there and then then I'll I'll turn it to you uh, Ben. Uh, but this is from McKaylee, who is, you know, sort of, sort of made a more of a comment really um, about the importance of uh, a executives to manage in a way that is transparent and that um, and and that exudes uh, trust 
and exudes kind of empowerment of, of uh, employees. And, and I think that, Ben, and I'd love to hear your comments on this, but I think that um, that trust is, is very important as we move towards uh, the, the kind of fourth phase of remote work productivity and have to rely on people to, to do the right thing consistently on their own, right? Right. Okay, yeah, no, great. So great, great questions. And I, I think, I, first of all, on, on kind of the first question, I mean, I, I do think there are some technological options like Beekeeper, which is the name of one for non-desk workers. But I actually think the number one, the premise of your point is actually a great one, which is that we've got to find a way to communicate and, and synchronize better. So that may be, you know, for non-desk workers, like, you know, the, the opportunity to, you know, how do we, um, you know, have set communications that can happen at a faster interval, however we normally communicate. And we've got to change cadences of that, number one. Uh, number two, um, we've got to uh, be able to, um, you know, get feedback in an efficient manner from those folks. And sometimes that's done with just, you know, if you don't have the technical solution, it's done by like kind of working through the management chain and making sure that, that sort of we're doing this and then trying to bring information down the chain and back up the chain. But certainly technological tools um, can really help. Um, and uh, specifically uh, technological tools that, that can work on a more pulse basis, right? Ones that can be sort of ongoing sort of pers per persistent feedback. Um, that's number one. Number two, in terms of trust, actually, I think you're doing the preview for some of the new rules coming up. But what I think is that trust from leadership is at a premium right now. So, uh, and, and why is that? Well, because you have to have trust that the company's making the right choices in the midst of a lot of uncertainty, right? Like, are, are, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it, is it, should we be exploring this new product launch or should we not do this new product launch? Was it wise to do a hiring freeze or, or heck in some companies even a, you know, a pay you know, cut? Uh, or was that not wise? Was that that a good decision, you know, is this ship, you know, going in the right direction or is this ship now adrift? So I actually think it's a little bit of preview of a new rule, but specifically trust becomes, you know, really, really important. Bring us to our next, uh, next question. So we want the phased approach to remote work management. So the old way we'd ask our question, this question of how can we best keep our employees informed, right? Just making sure that the information can disseminate they have it. How do we use internal communications to, to, um, to, to make information distribution, um, uh, you know, strong? The new way is much more of the question is how can we best keep our company connected? So all of these things we're doing is like, how can we increase the connections? What can we do uh, to, um, to sort of build those bridges and build those connections? And there's a framework that we use for this as well. Um, similar to the, the four stages of remote work productivity, and that's the four phases of culture building. So specifically for the connection right now and in the pandemic, these are sort of four ways that we sort of, and sort of phases that we get to that sense of connection. So the first phase is just shared experience, right? And so that's sometimes harder now uh, and easier said than done. So how do we get a, a unified sense of shared experiences, even if people are not occupying the physical sp same physical space, even if there's a lot of changes? And so what we try to do is do that. And there's, there's all kinds of things that we've done, you know, at, whether it's, it's other clients or we have a company that operates in 20 plus countries, right? Where we're, we're, we're doing many kinds of shared activities, games, trying to figure out um, just opportunities to kind of like chat a little bit about culture, like connections, uh, you know, we have this kind of virtual lunch thing we're doing between different countries, going back and forth and sharing culture. So, so one, for we've got to look at what are shared experiences to sort of form those connections. Two, we've got to get back to our united purpose. So somehow through all of that, we've got to redouble down on what that purpose is. We talked about some of the values are, but why is it that we do what we do? Why does that matter, especially now in the pandemic? And then third, we've actually got a third phase is, is to get common elements of culture that can be shared. So not limited to an office, not limited to a team. How do we get all of those different organizational units sort of, um, you know, uniting in a common culture? 
And then four, that leads us to true community. And what true community is, or our definition of it, and sort of how you foster in organizations is that when you're part of a true community, what that means is you are, um, you know that because you're a part of it, you are taken care of. And you also, because you're a part of it, want to take care of other people. That you know that your needs and the needs of others are all aligned so well that being part of that community makes you stronger for, for, for being for it. So these are culture building steps. And what I would say is that in this time for all of our sort of communications, all of the uh, activities, how are we doing these things in kind of a layered way? And how are we continuing to give our employees shared experiences? How are we building from that united purpose? How are we deriving from that common culture? And how does that ultimately lead to true community? And true community actually, you know, has to address what's going on now, right? Which is, you know, we got like health concerns. We have economic concerns. We have socio-cultural concerns. Today, Jackson, we probably have political concerns on both sides, right? Uh, so how do we do that? And, and, and I think that becomes a part of the internal communications as well. Yeah, Jackson, do you have a, have a thought or a comment? I think one, one specific question that uh, Julie uh, asked and, and Yvonne um, kind of uh, uh, echoed was we're, we're coming up obviously on, on the holiday season um, and, and many companies traditionally do things like they might have a, a secret Santa or they might have a company dinner uh, around the holidays, right? Um, and in Julie's case, she's coming from, you know, a, a small five-person company, but Yvonne's coming from a company of about um, 200 in nine different locations across five states, right? So this is this is a concern sort of whether you're at a, a, a small or more of a mid-sized or, or even an enterprise business. It's like, what do you do about these traditions that are, are beloved by your employees, but maybe a little harder to implement? And so I, I'd love to hear uh, some specific thoughts about how to deal with with kind of holiday traditions um, for your employees and holiday appreciation for your employees um, during the pandemic. Okay, sure. And, and I think one of the big things is that, you know, you can't just not do them. You've got to find a way because that does some of this culture building of the shared experience, united purpose and common culture and true community, number one. Um, and two, I think, you know, there's an understanding and, and we've certainly seen this and we've had some companies that we, you know, we've helped with implementing. We were just doing some, some stuff for Halloween and some other things like that, where they usually kind of have these sort of big shared moments. It's a little bit different now, but I think what you've got to do is, is try to use the medium um, in different ways uh, that, uh, mean, mean the, the remote medium in ways that just sort of embrace it and have fun with it. So here's an here example. I mean, we typically within, you know, one of our client companies, there's a lot of kind of like lunches and, and things like that, that, that people do. So just kind of shared, you know, mealtime experience. So we actually help coordinate like deliveries, you know, like, like food deliveries, Uber Eats. This was actually happening in multiple countries. So it, was, it, was, it wasn't Uber Eats in different countries of getting like a shared food experience delivered, you know, and it wasn't perfect. We were having trouble coordinating the exact time, but it wasn't too bad. Done through Zoom and having this sort of like great lunch cultural experience. So I think this is the year to sort of have creative ideas, embrace the medium. Um, I, I think expectations are, are sort of less, but it's, it's just like, but I think it's, you know, the effort, um, I think to do that doesn't go unnoticed by teams. And if companies are trying to say that like, hey, we have this great holiday tradition, we have this great thing that we do. It's a little bit this, this different this year, but we are doing everything we can um, to, to, to do it this way because we don't want to lose that. And uh, even if it doesn't turn out perfectly, right? Not quite the same to have a virtual lunch delivered by, by Uber Eats than have an in-person lunch. Um, but still, I think, that effort and that sort of commitment to, to connection and culture building doesn't go unnoticed. And in some ways, um, the culture can be strengthened in a lot of companies by doing that because um, the commitment to it is apparent because it's not quite as easy as before. So I hope that answers your question. And actually, I'd love to open it to the group for like, what are other things you are doing for, 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 for holiday parties and other things? But I think what a lot of what we're seeing is either virtual type experiences that are synchronous, I mean, we're all coming together, or else asynchronous experiences where people are more posting things and celebrating and doing their you know funny photo for this and we're having a, a different contest 
and we're delivering things through the mail and you know if and we're looking for other creative ways that we can sort of engage with with humor and good cheer or sort of take the essence of what we did and sort of deliver it a different way but i think you know that, that's a great question brings us to uh uh new rule number three which is build company culture with every communication so what we like to see for all of those, you know, if we're sending out a, a, an email blast, we're sending, we're doing a newsletter, whatever we're, you know, we're doing a post on our internet. How does that support the company culture? What are we doing? What is it about how we approach it that reinforces that culture we're trying to build? So what we have for a lot of our clients is just a checklist, right? Like what are our values? What is our culture? Um, uh, you know, how do we kind of, and then every communication we're evaluating on that. And sometimes it's subtle, right? The, the focus might just be an information update for, you know, how, you know, certain, I don't know, healthcare benefits are being processed and a change. But even in that, we're trying to say, how does this reinforce our culture? How does this reinforce our values? How and how we present it, do we reinforce those things? Because um, we need to be explicit about that. It's, it's truly important. Brings us to the next old way question, which is the old way was we would ask, you know, how can we best provide constructive feedback, right? So we're trying to engage employees. We know that regular feedback is more engaging. There's a general trend to shift away from like annual review and more to like pulse feedback or ongoing. I think the new way in the current situation is um, much more about how can we provide coaching opportunities? So it's not just feedback, but it's like, how do we reposition you know, feedback, praise, recognition to actually create um, coaching. And, and that's like when you had, and I don't know if anyone here, if you ever did like kind of sports or maybe you did, I don't know, like the arts or dance or music. And if you had that great coach or teacher or someone that was just a combination of, of all of like, it was feedback, it was encouragement, it was motivation, it was caring. And I think that was a trend we're seeing overall was like, you know, basically from like annual reviews to more pulse feedback, that pulse feedback to more of like interactive coaching and the dialogue because it's, it accomplished a lot of things at once. And so um, I actually think one of the aspects of that and, and, and one of the things to be cognizant of, uh, you know, when we work with our clients in, in sort of remote work is that many of the other kinds of like positive encouragement praise, recognition that you would sort of get implicitly, it's, it's harder to deliver, right? Meaning just like, just that feedback of direct interaction and sort of the sense that like, okay, you know, you know, I appreciate you. I get you. I understand what you're saying. You know, you're valuable. That was sort of, sort of implicit is, is maybe less so now just because, because, because of barriers to communication. So we call this the, the rule of, of five and you know, constructive feedback, improvements is all super important. But what the rule of five says is that there's a bunch of studies of high performing teams and high performing teams had this ratio of praise to sort of constructive criticism. It was five to one, five moments of praise for every one moment of constructive criticism. Now you may have team members or employees that need a lot of improvement, need a lot of work. What that tells you is you've got to find a way to take this more coaching approach to find moments of praise, moments of recognition, just so you can get enough built up so that you can have that constructive feedback be, 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 recognized, be, be recognized and well-received. And well, and well received. So I think in the new way right now, and I think for internal comms teams, is anything we can do to recognize more, anything we can do to praise more, anything we can do to sort of call out people who, who've really done well, I think is even more needed right now. And that brings us to New rule number four, which is coach with praise for high performing teams and find, and how do we have more opportunities to do that, more opportunities for recognition, more opportunities for positive encouragement. And that helps us set up the opportunity to have constructive feedback, criticism, room for improvements and have it be received in a positive way. And sometimes we forget that over Zoom and everything else, like we can give people some praise in a Zoom meeting, but many of the other indirect ways that we sort of recognize, acknowledge, praise, um, it's a little bit harder to, harder to do. So the old one, final question. We would ask, how can we best communicate 
key messages for our executive leadership, right? We'd say, okay, we got these kind of priorities. We're trying to align people for this quarter. We're having a merger and acquisition. We do a ton of consulting around that, how to combine communications and cultures. Um, we've got to communicate this. This is what we need to like kind of disseminate to the, to the troops. The new way is actually what one of the questions earlier was, Jackson, which was how can we best foster transparency and trust with our leadership? And specifically, because there is so much uncertainty, because there is, you know, companies that are sort of here one day and, and bankrupt the next, because it's unclear, you know, how we're all going to be working in December, let alone June of next year, um, more opportunities for transparently describing um, not only what we're doing, but how, what is our process for deciding what to do becomes hugely important. So it's not just that this is the direction our executive team has mapped out, so this is what we're gonna do, but what was our process in getting there? What were the things that we considered? How did we know that that was a good course of action? That becomes important, um, sort of not just the what, but the how, how, and, and the why. And then secondly, more opportunities for trust with our leadership. So that means more opportunities for direct communications. If you do have a leadership team that, that are good communicators, more opportunities for things like video or things like where they can talk directly in an unfiltered way. If your executive team, we have clients like this too, that is not as good communicators, more filtered or curated ways that we can sort of amplify what they're saying in a way that builds transparency and, and trust. So I think right now what we're seeing, and we'll see this if, if sort of the pandemic continues in this way, is much more need for, for, for higher volume communications from, from, from leadership, um, much more um, sort of ex explanation of the why. Um, so explaining why and, and, and how we got to this process, what were the things that we considered to improve transparency? Uh, and then ultimately uh, trust, um, in which includes, and, and elements of trust includes you know, I'm being heard, so opportunities for feedback and feedback loops. Um, trust includes that um, uh, regular check-ins. So it's not just like we hear about this once and then uh, we never hear from it again. All of those things put those premium on that. So all of that is the setup for, um, we need new rule number five, which is communicate more directly from the C-suite and communicate more directly. And, and, if, and again, that doesn't have to be direct from them. If you don't have a team that's great communicators, I think that's kind of our role as, as internal comms folks to, to, to sort of amplify and improve that. But I think we need much more. And I think in moments of uncertainty, we need more, not less communication, transparency, and trust from leadership. Um, and that's uh, certainly, the, I think, the opportunity we have uh, before us now. So, Jackson, before I end up on my final kind of thought, probably the most important thing I'll send today, is there any kind of final questions, final comments for the group? Um, post them in your chat now, and I'd love to know more about your biggest internal communication challenge. I don't know if it's like, how are we going to do the holiday party in December? Or it's like, yeah, I've told my CEO that we need to communicate more, and he or she just doesn't want to do it. Whatever it is, post it now, and then Jackson, if you have any kind of final comments, and then I'll end up with, I think, the most important thought, which is important for anyone who works in Internal employee, internal communications, um, sort of, sort of HR performance. Uh, kind of my, my most important thought of the day. Sure. Um, well, McKaylee is uh, sort of underscoring uh, what I think is a good point that communication is is two way, um, and and so how is it that you foster an environment in which it it seems to be safe and is safe for employees to speak their minds without fear of retaliation or, or without fear of, of maybe being seen as not being team players. Um, what, what can be done in order to foster that, that environment? And, and I bring this up um, because I think this is a, a, a good point, a good question that's been raised uh, a couple of times now. Okay, sure. And, and I actually think one of the, one of the best ways that, that we've found to do it is actually praise it, recognize it celebrate it, right? So when someone does that and it's behavior, and particularly when it's done in a constructive way, right? I, I think for, for any sort of internal communications, you're like, yes, we want this, we want stuff brought up. We want people to be heard. We want feedback loops, but we might not want it, you know, in, in, certain, in a certain manner or a certain way or, or a certain, you know, delivery of it. So I think one of the, the best things you can do is actually praise that, reward that, thank that, um, and, and recognize that when someone models the behavior you want, um, do, do that. And then, and then the second thing, though, I think is actually with feedback that is super important. 
and I think this is one of the challenges for a lot of organizations, um, is that you have to close the loop, right? So no, so even if they're heard, even if they're celebrated, it's like, how does that close the loop back? How do I feel like um, that, that accomplished something, that got somewhere? So I think systems to do that now are, um, are really important. And, and, you know, on, and honestly, we've even noticed with some of our clients that, that things that were simple before the pandemic are suddenly hard. Like we've had clients where, you know, yeah, we have whole teams of like, you know, it used to be just like, you know, they didn't get some kind of input they need for a certain project. They just like you know, go next door and tap their neighbor and say, hey, I need the password to get in this thing. But now people are just like, yeah, I sent a Slack message and no one responded to me, right? So, so, so what, what are we going to do? So all of those are ways that I think, you know, praising, recognizing, but then really focusing on kind of the feedback loop. And when the feedback loop then is communicated to the group, not just the person, then people say, I see it. They take this seriously. It's okay to say that. Yeah, Jackson, did you have a, a comment or another question? Yeah, Yvonne raises a, a good point. Um, she she says that uh, she started an internal newsletter a few months back. And, sorry, I got meeting reminders coming in. Okay. And yeah, the readership is not uh, is not gaining a lot of traction. So she's wondering, is are there like kind of good relevant things that can be provided um, yes. in, in order to encourage? readership or what can be done to foster readership of, of an internal communication like this? Yes, actually, this is actually, this is a great question. It's one of our specialties, which is we like to write internal communications like it's headlines uh, for an external audience, right? Like we might do in a consumer communication or something else. And so our model for that, if you're just doing it to sort of get engagement is, is simple, surprising and significant, which is the same framework we use for the viral marketing work we do, the same framework we do for like content marketing. So what it is, is that can we take that headline and simplify it enough that people can get it at a glance? Number one. Number two, surprising. Can it break the pattern that people's expectations? Like, oh yeah, we always get these kind of communications from the company. We always get these email newsletters. Oh, isn't this uh, some kind of announcement I don't need to know about right now? So can we add some surprise to it? And then third, can we make it be significant? Can it say something important? So I actually think, you know, whether those are email subject lines, those are headlines in your newspaper, thinking of that from the framework of simple, can I simplify this? Surprising, I've got to break the expectation in some way to get noticed. And then significant, can I say something really important? Um, you know, that is great. And actually, I think some of the times, uh, we sometimes do this for our clients or also it's like your other copywriting teams or other folks that are like, you know, making that really catchy um, sales communication that's trying to go out to convert a new customer. You can use some of that thinking in sort of the headline writing of this. So I think it's going from a, again, information dissemination process. Like we just want to uh, pass this information along to you. And then we start to be looking at an engagement process. How do we engage you? And if we want to engage you, we've got to have a great subject line. We've got to have a great um, uh, you know, headline. Our first couple sentences that we write have to be like engaging and on point. We can't have long-winded introductions. And certainly that's something that we help a ton of clients with. So you would, would, if, if you want to, the person asks a question, if you want to like, um, uh, I'm going to give my email address in a second. Uh, you can just shoot it over to me. I'll take a look at one of your things and sort of make some suggestions. I'm uh, happy, happy to do that. Or you can certainly, you know, be engaged to actually improve it. And the other part I just say is that we, all of those metrics we track, it becomes important to track it with KPIs, right? And those could be things like opens and, and, and clicks, but it can also be some more advanced metrics like time spent reading, which we can help you implement for tracking. That could be, was this saved or printed or forwarded? We can track some things like that too. So I think a lot of metrics, so you can see what the drop off is. Um, we can also do some things like send people to a page where there's like the announcement and do a heat map on that page and sort of see where people are going, how much time they're spending, where they're dropping off. And so if we do that, we can improve it. Um, same with videos. Um, we'll put a lot of tracking in videos for internal communications and say, this is a video for the CEO. How much was watched? You know, uh, everyone's fallen off after two minutes. Why? What happened there? And then using that for feedback. So I actually think, you know, sort of data tracking is a huge part of that, but simple, surprising, and significant is the framework. So let me end on the most important kind of thought of the day. And, uh, and, and I'll kind of pass on some more information. So one, um, shoot me an email. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, if you have a communication you want to send our way, we'll give you some feedback, uh, you know, uh, just, just, just because, just because we'd like to help. Um, or if you have projects, um, we, we love to, you know, we're, we're a deep shop in terms of 
Um, we have content creators on staff, whether those are like video producers and video editors and animators and graphic designers and long form copywriters and short form copywriters. Um, so we can certainly help with a lot of internal communications efforts, or we have a lot of strategists that need to build up more of a plan, more of a program. Um, we have all that internally. Um, uh, our core offices are uh, Austin, Texas, San Francisco, California, New York, New York, uh, London in the UK, but we have smaller satellite offices uh, uh, all over. And of course, now it's easy because everyone's kind of remote anyway. So one, shoot me an email. Uh, two, this is me on LinkedIn. So um, if you take a snap of that QR code, it will take you to the page. And, and, and I don't accept every LinkedIn request. Just say you attended my employee engagement webinar, and then I will definitely accept it. Um, this is the address, and, and there's a little tip within your LinkedIn app. You can scan QR codes, and it will take you right there and connect with people. Um, and then before I end on the final thought of the day, kind of my biggest piece of advice, um, I just want to mention that within TOP, which stands for, again, Test, Optimize, Perform, um, we're a different kind of agency and a different kind of agency network. So everything that we do for employee communications we you know or, or employee engagement we collect data we validate data we optimize data we time data we integrate data we scale data so we are a really data driven organization because we think you know if you don't measure you can't optimize and so if you want to have improvements for other metrics other kpis other okrs that you're held to for your work and you're like I, I need to show improvement i need to drive you know show that people are, are reading that email um, newsletter um, let us know and we can usually set up those kind of tracking programs and also help with the creative. And so finally, let me end on my final um, thought of the day. And, and that is this. I, I personally believe um, that now is a golden age for internal communications. I think they're an employee engagement. I think with all of the changes that are happening due to the acceleration of remote work, changes in, in how we work, uh, concern over um, you know, what's going to be the aftermath of this pandemic. It's actually a premium misplaced, and I think that's the whole premise of, of the five new rules we talked about, on effectively communicating, building transparency and trust, demonstrating higher level purpose, um, using the four phases of uh, sort of remote work productivity. All of that has a premium. So the great news is the job that you do, the work you do is super important now. And if you're super important, that means you're valuable. And if you're valuable, it's a great opportunity for you to deliver a lot of value. So I think this is a time for everyone in our field to kind of like double down to assess how we can impact organizations and our organization. And also, this is a great time where we've seen a lot of our clients sell in new programs, um, get approval for more like culture building activities that maybe you know the CEO wasn't really behind before, but now realizes there's a need improve communication. So this is just a great opportunity. So I hope these five rules have been helpful. Would love to continue the conversation. Please message me. And I think now is the time and there's this window really from right now through the middle of next year where there's still a lot of uncertainty. We can all play great roles. We can all um, sort of move forward the, 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 the art and the science of internal communications and employee engagement. And we can do great things for our company and do really, really meaningful work. So I'm excited to be in the field. I hope you are too, and I wish you all uh, that kind of success. All right, thanks so much. Thank you to Jackson for hosting, and send me your emails, uh, ben.kaplan at topagency.com, and I'm happy to answer them. Cheers.